Welcome to Terrible Lizards, a podcast about dinosaurs with Dr. David Hone and Izzy Lawrence. On this week's episode, I rediscover my favourite dinosaur as a child, the Heterodontosaurus. Plus, Beck Hill asks, what is the ultimate dinosaur footwear? Hello and welcome back to Terrible Lizards. I don't know what you've been doing all week. We've been very busy chasing our tails and running up hills and down dales. Do we, do, do you ever, have you ever been down dale, Dave? Probably at some point. <laughs> I try not to go to Yorkshire that much, so... Mm. I think walking in the dale and looking up the ravine is the way to find dinosaurs, isn't it? That's what we've yes. discussed in previous... episodes. definitely. Yeah. So you want to be in the dale, and now I'm having references to Dale Winton and it's all going a bit wrong. So, let us um, continue to... Uh, uh, do this dinosaur podcast that would seem that would seem preferable to almost anything else we've started with so far uh, because of your sheer refusal to do stegosaurus yet again uh this episode we uh will be talking about heterodontosaurus well the heterodontosaurs yes but obviously heterodontosaurus perhaps unsurprisingly is a heterodontosaur can we start with its name because that implies that all other dinosaurs are the same to themselves because there must be a homodontosaurus if there's a heterodontosaurus surely right so you've got the you've got the hetero down and you know what the saurus is so what's don or don't uh teeth yeah so they've got different teeth that's their key oh. feature they've got multiple tooth types and that makes them really rather unusual so your heterodontosaurs are a group of ornithischians so your yeah your overall herbivorous group but they're kind of weird ornithischians in quite a few ways and for a very long time we didn't really know where they went in the dinosaur family tree they're obviously ornithischians but most people i think had them down as being something relatively close to the origin of the big group called Seropoda, which is the hadrosaurs and iguanodonts and then also the ceratopsians and pachycephalosaurs so of course all the big later ones that are particularly prevalent in the cretaceous and heterodontosaurs were considered part of that group and in a lot of ways you can see why because they kind of look like little hadrosaurs or little iguanodontians they're a meter long to two meters long oh we half of that being tail yeah they're really quite tiny running around on their back legs but could probably walk on four legs or certainly stand on all fours at least occasionally we'll so, good. we'd be using them to go upstairs yeah I so mean, so yeah. A, you know but a lot like how we think of hadrosaurs and iguanodons and the early ceratopsians like Cetacosaurus and things like this so they fit that they fit that kind of body profile quite well they've T-rex got snacks yeah they've got fairly good chewing teeth or teeth that'd be good chewing's not quite the right word with a reptile but you know good for processing plant matter the specimens were hanging around in the later jurassic and early cretaceous so you can see why that would also fit in the kind of timeline kind of sense and then i want to say kind of like the late 1990s early 2000s they got moved and what big new analysis pulled them down to basically be the earliest ornithischians and that also makes sense in some ways because they're really quite small and we've talked about this before small animals are you know evolutionary lineages often start with small animals they don't have these reinforcing um ossified tendons along the base of the tail or along the whole tail which is almost universal in ornithischian and yet missing in the heterodontosaurs and of course you don't get that in sauropods or theropods i think i think we need to take a pause about what's um, you know what's an ossified tendon yeah so this is this is a tendon which is so strong it's become bone well it's had a lot of stress on it and so that will ossify it so and, and this is just because these are the really strong tendons that hold the tail onto the thighs and make yeah them, so it, they're, they're buttocks aren't they but they don't have buttocks right so you, you in in most ornithischians you get this down most of the tail um starting kind of in the lower back over the pelvis and then along the tail and often particularly the hadrosaur good hadrosaur specimens you see this spectacularly like this lovely crisscross series where it forms loads and loads of little diamonds because they're going at kind of about 30 degrees to each other down the tail um and yet yeah, ossified tendons they turn up in a few groups they, they're present in a couple of pterosaurs quite interestingly um but anyone who thinks this is super weird you will have seen this before Go back to your turkeys, uh, even in, a, in the odd chicken, but certainly in things like turkeys and pheasants. If you've ever pulled one apart, you have like these shards of bone coming off of joints. And these are exactly the same thing. They are tendons which are taking a lot of strain. And to stiffen them up, they've turned to bone. Now, a fun fact when they butcher turkeys, apologies if you don't want to listen to butchering turkeys, switch this off for 30 seconds because I'm going to talk about it. But part of the way you do that, obviously after you've killed the bird, bird is you put their feet up on a hook and Mm. then you pull and that is mainly not to just remove the 
feet, but to remove that really long tendon, you know, that goes all the way down the leg. Now, what's really cool is, because, you know, I cooked that turkey over Christmas Mm -hmm. um, in order to dissect a dinosaur and go to Izzy Tube to see that video of me getting slowly and slowly madder and everything getting greasier. Because I cooked the bird with that tendon still in with its feet on, not only did its feet sort of claw up as if they were holding some sort of precious jewel, but also the legs straightened because that tendon cooked and when it cooked it contracted and then made the whole bird appear to be sort of like you know about to do a dance a marching it looked like it was about to do a march which yeah it was pretty cool but those are really strong tendons like you have to put your entire body weight through you can't just pull a a, a turkey's feet off yeah 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 Yeah. they really don't like it so don't do that yeah it's safe to listen again now people Yeah, ossified tendons are one of those, is a pretty key feature of ornithischians. As I say, it's not present in all of them, but it's very, very common, not present in heterodontosaurs. You can see why that might link them to being earlier representatives. And that's really where they've been ever since, for like the last 20 odd years. We now recognize them as this earliest branch of the ornithischians. Um, the other thing they've got, again, is this teeth. We've kind of gone out, let's come back again to teeth. So they, yeah, they've got these fairly normal herbivorous type teeth in the back of the jaw, but what they have got at the front is a pair of fairly fang-like teeth in the top of the mouth pointing down right right near the front and behind that in the lower jaw a really big fang that like sticks right up to the fact that they actually have a notch in the upper half of the skull for these what? giant fang each side to sit into we're going to get back to this but before then before then I'm fascinated by this idea that these are the earliest ornithischians because you said they were around in the late Jurassic I assumed ornithischians had been around much longer than that i thought they were mid and early maybe even late triassic so i'm way out of my imagining of this well th- so this... when did the dinosaur group split so that this is where we this is where we have our classic problems with gaps in the fossil record and goes back to discussions we had in probably series two but obviously i can't remember already um <laughs> about inverted commas ornithoscalida so yeah the traditional idea is that you've got your the saurisians on one side your carnivorous theropods and your big sauropodomorphs and on the other side the ornithischians. We have got theropods and sauropodomorphs knocking around in the late Triassic, and they had to have an origin at some point, and that's probably latest Middle Jurassic, early late Triassic for dinosaurs. And if those, if that group has split off, kind of by definition, their nearest relatives, the ornithischians, must also have split off. Except we don't have any Triassic ornithischians. We have several specimens and species which various people have said may be ornithischians, um, and I think it's fair to say that these are contested. What there, what there definitely isn't is something which is obviously and indisputably and absolutely definitively an ornithischian in the Triassic. So you're left wow. with two possibilities. Either they're hanging around and we just haven't found them, which is at least possible. You, you do get groups which appear, don't do anything for a long time. They're very low diversity. They're only living in a couple of places. So they're not going to show up in the fossil record. And then things change. Remember, there's an extinction at the end of the Triassic. New environment environments, new opportunities, and suddenly they get going. Perfectly possible, but would be a bit odd. Or secondly, we fundamentally got dinosaur relationships wrong, and ornithischians don't sit right at the base of the tree and are popping out some point later, which would explain why we can't find them. Yeah, no, it does make sense. It it still works, but in my head I thought like Stegosaurus and Ankylosaurus were much earlier, but they're not. They are late Jurassic, aren't they? If not, actually, I think Ankylosaurus are later, aren't they? So, yes, the classic Stegosaurus itself is late Jurassic. There are Stegosaurs in the middle and indeed early Jurassic. Okay. There, as I say, there are no truly definitive Triassic Ornithischians. So we, we're either missing them or we've got their phylogeny wrong. We don't know which. <laughs> and this is a major source of contention and argument. So let's go back into what I'm imagining like a sort of Lego head where the tooth, you know, the little, you get teeth on Lego that fit into the thing above. And so it's like a socket it and that it does, that's a really bad example well, what well what it would really look like um is a bunch of those small deer that you get you, you know there are some little fanged deer out there and of course we have them in the uk as well because they've been introduced um and it would look a lot like that now mostly their fangs point downwards but it's exactly the same thing yeah it's not like it's pointing into their skull no but it's where you've got you know pigs also very similar you know things like warthog okay it's much bigger in a warthog but you know this big tooth sticking out and 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 
sat there. Um, so yeah, if you just turn the nose of a deer upside down, and there's a lovely image, um, that's pretty much what you've got for a heterodontosaurus. So you've got a pair of little fangs on the upper jaw, and then this really big one in the lower jaw. Um, and that combination, get onto obviously the function of those, but certainly those smaller fangs um, could well be used for processing other kinds of food, in particular things like insects or very small animals like lizards or whatever. In other words, maybe this group is an omnivore, or they're omnivorous, and they're eating both plants and animals. And again, that's kind of the sort of thing you might expect for an early member of a group whose ancestors were probably carnivorous and all of whom later relatives are herbivorous. Well, it's quite likely that you're going to go from <laughs> carnivory to omnivory through to herbivory. So in that regard, at least they kind of ecologically make sense as well. It also, because if it's only one or two metres long, it's short. It's not going to be, it's going to be like... Yeah, it's pretty tiny. Yeah, it's going to be sort of up to your knee, is what I'm imagining. Yeah, and things much. up to your knee eat anything. I mean, I'm thinking, you know, like crows and blackbirds and, you know, all sorts of little, you know, even my cats will go after some, they eat grass. Well, that's that. the thing, you know, lot, lots of animals are far more omnivorous than people think. There's lots of records of crocodiles eating fruit. There's lots of records of things like foxes eating fruit. Um, so... Oh my God, I've got the image of a crocodile eating an apple and it's adorable. <laughs> Sorry, it's in my head. <gasps> a crocodile going, oh, eating a ban- a small crocodile eating a banana slowly. That's amazing. That's made me happy. Well, you, well you, you, can, you can draw that later. But it's, and I'm Great. not suggesting that crocodiles aren't fundamentally carnivorous. Of course they are, and they show adaptations for that. But, but I, they but like just making bananas. the point that, they, you know, these diets are broader than people think. Um, and so actually, you know, we've talked about this from the carnivore and the herbivore side before. You know, rarely even 100% carnivores really are in that regard, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, so there's some, there's some, bleh. so it fits in with that kind of pattern of where we might expect. So I think most people are now very happy with the idea that the heterodontosaurs represent some of the early Saurolithicians. We do have some from, I want to say, the early Jurassic now, which we didn't earlier on. So that okay. brings the heterodontosaur origins down closer to when you might expect them to appear, regardless of that earlier issue of exactly when things start. But they're pretty widespread as well. So Heterodontosaurus itself, which is known from a bunch of really nice specimens, and there's a bunch of casts about of this of one specimen in particular which have got into loads of different museums is from South Africa that was the first one named and I want to say something like 1962 1968 something like that um, so they're a relatively recent group in that regard um, there's a bit from the UK it's a jaw but it's fairly convincingly a heterodontosaur um, we've got uh, fruitier dens if I'm saying it right from the Morrison so um, North America you got fruit from Morrison's so the, the, there's a there's a fruitier <laughs> site or locality or even a form actually because i don't do the morrison okay. very much um and so fruitier den so the little one from from fruitier basically rather than fruit um but there's so we've got an african one we've got a european one we've got a north american one there was one only a couple of years ago described from south america and argentina down in patagonia so wow. quite a long way south um so you've got that one down in patagonia and then you've got tianyulong which is an animal we're going to talk quite a bit about as well up in china so they're really getting around you know the americas europe africa Asia. Let's be honest, they're probably knocking around in Australia. We just haven't found one yet. Because remember, there's not that many Australian dinosaurs known. But they're a pretty worldwide group, certainly. That's pretty cool. And they're all the same sort of similar tiny... How long do they last? Sorry, we've talked about when they were, but did they go right the way up to the extinction or did they... No, we've got a couple that are in the early Cretaceous. And as I say, I think we've got a couple now which go down to the, I want to say, the later part of the early Jurassic. So the whole of the, pretty much the whole of the Jurassic and into the early Cretaceous. So a pretty long mm. time. So remember, Stegos- Steg- about the same as Stegosaurs. So they're, they're relatively early. I love the fact that we keep mentioning Stegosaurs. And they <laughs> creep over. <laughs> um, but, you know, Stegosaurs are, again, a relatively early group. They're appearing in the in the Jurassic round for the whole Jurassic, get into the Cretaceous where they're really petering out and don't last much longer. But that's, a you know, a very healthy chunk of time. My heterodontosaurs, they're around for quite a long time. You know, at least some early groups kind of appear and vanish. We've got things like Herrerasaurus and the Herrerasauridae. Um, so this group of early animals, which sometimes were considered theropods and the earliest theropod group, and sometimes considered just out 
outside dinosaurs, they kind of flit around that group, but they're not around for very long. Uh, you know, and the inverted commas pro sauropods, the you know the bipedal ones that come before the true sauropods, and yeah, they're they're dominant in the late Triassic, and they get into the early Jurassic, and they don't hang around much longer, and they're gone. Um, so you know, even some pretty major groups don't last very long. So the heterodontosaurs are doing pretty well in that regard, and they're this absolute yeah kind of mainstay small ornithischian for you know a good part of the Mesozoic. They would have been the smallest little theropod food animal <laughs> running around for, for really quite a long time. And it looks like in a lot of different places, you know. Well, those, those you know, who have listened to our bonus episode because they are patrons, um, they will know all about the little tiny mammals that the, um, the Heterodontosaurus Dontosaurus. would have been maybe picking up and chewing as well at this time because there were little voli type things. There were smaller creatures is what I'm saying, but they were... Yeah, yeah, pretty, and pretty they much. They are basically and... turkey sized, that sort of bit, bit smaller. Yeah, or, or smaller. I mean, Heterodontosaurus is one of the bigger ones at getting on for two meters. The smaller ones are probably around one meter or even a bit less. Because remember, it's um, it's two meters in length, not two meters in height. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These smallest ones are much more kind of big chicken kind of size rather than big turkey. Yeah plus tail. Though again, you know, really basically just a very miniaturised hadrosaur. But they would have had like bird-like eyes and then this sort of mammal-like mouth a bit like a deer but upside down. Yeah, they've got this fairly, they've got a fairly stumpy, I want to say kind of reptile head in the sense that you know, you look at ceratopsians and their heads are really weird. You look at hadrosaurs and they're actually kind of horse-like rather unsurprisingly in that overall head shape because they're kind of doing something similar. These are rather more lizardy in that regard, though with really nice big eyes. They, they probably Probably had really pretty good eyesight for their side. I don't know if you've um, looked this up when you were researching, you know, reminding yourself bits of this episode, but the chewing is really interesting to me because they don't do what mammals do. They don't do the side to side grinding of things. Yeah. They do up and down ch- chump- chomping. Yeah. So what you've, there's an idea called the pleurokinetic skull, and I'm not sure how well supported this is anymore, but I, I'm pretty sure it's still considered a, a viable idea for what certainly things like like hadrosaurs are doing whereby what what you're doing when you're chewing ultimately is you're trying to move two surfaces across each other as much as possible with the food in between which is the molars and we and we and things like horses are doing that by yeah taking the whole thing and moving it and sort of circular like a pestle and mortar kind of grindy grind yeah down. but the important thing is that you know we can ultimately move our jaws side to side as well as up and down the reptiles never evolved that their jaws basically move up and down in in a single, simple vertical plane. But what you can do is if rather than the molars or the surface of the molars being effectively perfectly flat and coming top to bottom on each other, is you can shift that plane to about 45 degrees. And so okay. in inside out going down to up. So Im- imagine <laughs> if the surface of your teeth were as a kind of giant V would ultimately, if you carried on that angle, they'd meet in the midline of your mouth along your tongue. Everybody at the moment is just feeling their tongue around their teeth go what what yeah well it's hard it's one of those things it's really easy to draw a picture really hard to describe so imagine rubbing your, like you're in a praying position you're rubbing your hands together those are your teeth surfaces and then just tilting your hands so that you're they're they're tilted point over yeah. your shoulder so just go yeah. from vertical prayer to just flip it over to point at your left ear prayer and rub yeah. and that's the sort of angle yeah. we're well but, about. It, but it's both sides obviously, obviously. it's both well, sides they, they i go. don't have four hands day I don't have four hands. Didn't think this through, no. did you? I could do it with my feet, actually. I might try this. But what that means is that as the power of that jaw closes, they're now not going to meet and stop. What they're going to do is slide something past each other. Now, the whole skull is going to have to deform a little to do this. This is the kinesis of the pleurokinetic skull. Kinesis, movement. The skull is moving. And of course, remember, reptiles don't have a solid block of a head like we do. If you've ever seen videos of snakes, you know, they can move individual parts of their lower jaws in all kinds of horrible ways because they're not all some giant solid block. And so the whole skull will basically move, or at least big 
big chunks of it will move to allow this movement, but it will then grind those teeth surfaces against each other. And that's what they're doing with that kind of action. When we talk about inverted commas, chewing in hadrosaurs, which is why I try not to use that word because it implies something that they're absolutely not doing. They, they would be able to blow bubble gum either, I reckon. That's yeah because yeah. if you tried to animate that it would look so broken it wouldn't look real yeah. at all i'm just trying to think because occasionally you do get i mean like things like frogs can sort of like that they look very odd when they're swallowing and eating things and they they do have quite mushy faces when they're trying to yeah but, chomp down but, yes snake snake swallowing stuff is the best is the best thing i mean not just the way that the whole skull can almost disarticulate but the the literally the left and right drawers jaws are very well separated and you will see on some some videos like one side of lower jaw like completely coming out and moving around to try and grab something while the other side stays still in a way that you know we are not able to no. do short of some very drastic surgery or motorbike accident to smash your face up yeah. um it's really quite an achievement and now i should say all this pleurokinesis when we talk about that in the hadrosaurs i don't know what the heterodontosaurs are capable of i don't think they can do anything quite that extreme um i suspect they can't well it would explain why if if they've they've got room for the fangs if they can't separate it because if they could separate it they probably wouldn't need such a you know they just push them out that's a fair point yeah they do have this this kind of as i say socket basically in the skull for it to sit into which is really quite neat that that as a feature turns up in a whole bunch of different animals um there's even these ancient amphibians from the kind of uh, are they in the carboniferous or the permian it doesn't really matter but pre-mesozoic uh and occasionally they have these really big fangs in the lower jaw uh, that these are really big flat headed thing so they, they look like someone got a giant newt and ran over it with a steamroller you know the the head is you know i couldn't get my arms around it and yet it's about 10 centimeters high it's very very flat but they'll have these giant fang teeth in the lower jaw and literally have a pair of holes in the top of the head and these teeth just stick up through them when its mouth is shut it's the only way they can fit them in that's amazing so it's like a venus fly trap of dreams yeah but but like but like fang holes is a thing in a bunch of different animals in that regard heterodontosaurs aren't that weird um even though they're, they're obviously quite unusual for dinosaurs and and then of course the t those big fangs what are they doing with them you're going to say sexual selection i am going to say sexual selection or at least yes yeah, sociosexual dominance it has been suggested and not by me uh that's an idea which goes back uh to at least kind of 2003 2004 probably before um so there's a, a book called The Dinosauria, which was like this famous um, research textbook. There was one from 1990. There was a second edition in 2003. The third edition was supposed to be published two or three years ago, and no one knows quite what's happened to it. <laughs> Development hell. This is the problem when, I mean, obviously COVID's made it even worse, but already it's like, we'll just get 100 different researchers from around the world all to write chapters all at the same time to be ready in the same format. Never going to <laughs> <laughs> Absolute nightmare. Herding cats. <laughs> But yes, but the, the classic second edition of the dinosaur, I know that the heterodontosaur chapter, they talk about tooth function, the fang function, I should say, is, you know, potentially being intraspecific combat, fighting other members of your species. Again, this is exactly what we see in pigs. This is exactly what we see in deer. So there is an analogue for this kind of tooth shape in this position in the skull for small herbivorous animals. So it's a it's not a massive stretch to, to line that up. And even, you know, our ancestors, possibly, but also other um, apes and monkeys... They like to have big fangs just to show who yeah, is dominant. Yeah, the baboons do for, for the same yeah. kind of reason. Yeah, exactly. Um, there's been arguments about whether or not these fangs are sexually dimorphic, mm -hmm. so whether or not they turn up in males versus females. There's some animals that don't appear to have them, but then they may also be juveniles, in which case, if this is a sexually selected feature, remember, you wouldn't expect it to be necessarily present in juveniles. So, and, who knows? But You know, not all, like, modern and birds are dimorphic. I mean, my favourites are starlings, as you know, and both genders have beautiful plumage and they're both gorgeous. Both sexes. Exactly. Je oh, yeah, sorry. Both <laughs> both sexes um, are dimorphic. Uh, they both have the beautiful plumage and yeah. the shiny eyes and the prettiness the ch and the chirpy songs and they can tell each well, other right. apart. And, so. Yeah, and and you get some you get some neat little systems. So, so one thing that was written about years and years ago, I want to say it was Christine Janice and Scott Sam Sampson, but definitely several people published on this idea is looking at some of the big modern herbivores as analogues for various different social systems and what that means ecologically. And a really neat thing that you see 
with antelope is that horn size and shape can correlate with how big you are and also your social structure, which sounds unlikely, but if you work through the implications, it actually makes perfect sense. Okay. If you're a big herbivore, you need to eat a lot of food. Staying in one place is not a good idea because you're going to run out. And you also need to eat just about everything that's available. We've talked about this before for big herbivores. They, they can't be selective feeders. They have to hoover up absolutely everything. Okay. Um, and that is going to potentially potentially favor living in groups because if you're out in the open and you've got to spend a lot of time eating and you've got to keep moving to find more food you're going to be really vulnerable to predators hanging around in a group where at least someone's keeping their eye out is probably quite a good idea also if you want to find a mate and you want to do all the other social things that you need to do to get on if you're eating all day you don't have a lot of time to go on a big trek looking for a, a lady or a man potentially though of course you're if you're the same species you're probably hanging around in fairly similar areas looking for that food so that, that shouldn't be too much of a problem. But you can see how size and diet will, would, would drive sociality in that context. But then that's also going to change horn function because um, if you're a male, you're now hanging around with loads of other females and these other males are also going to be interested. So you're going to be quite interested in fighting other males. And for the females, that may be less of a problem. So if females not necessarily fighting each other that much, what they might want to do is fight predators. So what you tend to see with big animals antelope is either males have horns and females don't or males have horns which are good for fighting other males and females have horns that are good for fighting lions predators right so you'll see for example um you know a whole bunch of mid-sized antelope males will have nice kind of complex horns they've either got a spiral this classic kind of lyre shape so they, so they lock. interlock yeah. with each other and wrestle and females will have shorter straighter horns because that's good for stabbing in the eyes <laughs> right. But what happens if you're relatively small? So you've probably heard of things like Dick Dick. I know Dick Dicks. I follow Dick Dick Picks. <laughs> So Dick Dick's is really tiny little antelope. Like ridiculously tiny, like cat size. Yeah. They're so cute. The smallest ones. But there's a, there's a bunch in that kind of field and some of the smaller diker, which are another group of small antelope. These are relatively small. Um, that means they can be quite selective in what they're eating. They can focus on very high quality food, new buds, new shoots, fruit, flowers, seeds, nuts, maybe the odd root, stuff like this. That's a relative, you know, and that makes that the area that you need to cover even smaller because every bite that you take in is really good there's tons of energy in it it's probably really easy to digest so if you find a really good area that's probably worth defending you it's the opposite of wanting to hang around in a group a you're nice and small so you can get into cover as well um so that's going to give you some protection from predators and b you've got an area that you want to keep and you want to keep other people out well with probably the exception of a mate so what you often find with the really small ones is that male and females live together in pairs and now they're not constantly fighting off other males if you're a male and not doing anything if you're a female both of them are interested in defending their territory from encroaching other animals and therefore both males and females have horns and they're very similar horns because they're both interested in fighting off other members of their species who might come into their territory and so you really do see this body size is then linked to horn shape and social grouping structure um, and in that regard if we follow that analogy through, you might expect that those tusks are actually, therefore, a social dominance feature, um, but purely one of territory defence for pairs of heterodontosaurs living together, rather than a classic sexual selection structure for males to show off to other males. That's cool. The immediate counteraction to my counterargument to my own argument is that mostly we find these in fairly arid, deserty conditions, which isn't that classic. Lots of trees, dense. But isn't scrub, that also to do Food. with the type of environments that you're likely to find fossils in because if you're a Potent lovely a lovely rainforest type thing is going to yeah. eat up any bones before right. they for, get for buried. at least a couple of them at least yeah um but still again we found them on five continents already and they tend to turn up in arid environments mm. um certainly not exclusively tianyulong from china from these classic layouting beds 
Um, so that very forested and pretty temperate and probably rained an awful lot um, at certain times of the year. I mean, certainly big lakes everywhere because that's what the things are falling into. Um, but still, I, I mean, again, I'm not suggesting I'm right. I'm not sure most of that is in the literature, but we do know that these various systems do correlate. People have totally applied them to dinosaurs and at least discussed whether or not things like these mast herd of ceratopsians are linked to this exact structure and what they're doing. Um, of course, it doesn't sit necessarily brilliantly because as we talked about before in my own work, we don't have the dimorphism we might expect in a lot of these groups when they are doing these big herding things. Again, there's a couple of exceptions. Water buffalo, the African water buffalo. Males and females look really pretty similar to each other and they've all got very similar horns um, and they tend to hang around in big herds. But the, the more kind of classic deer or big antelope model is not really what we see in horned dinosaurs or displaying dinosaurs at least. It's inevitably complicated, but certainly there are some interesting ecological analogues we can make of that. That's pretty cool. And um, do Heterodontosaur, uh, Heterodontosaurus, because we're not doing Heterodontosauri day, um, do they have any specialisations in terms of like aquatic or flight or feathers even? I, I mean, I know they're on Thysians. Well, so, so, so there we go. So we talked about Cetacosaurus first episode, and Cetacosaurus yeah. a, a while back. Right. So as we remember when we told that was the first one that we found with these filaments. Oh God, it's a really derived Ornithischian. What does that mean? Are these filaments entirely independent of feathers? Is there some deep hidden ancestry going all the way back into the Triassic that we've never seen? It's a bit weird. We never found any other Ornithischians with them. Dot, dot, dot. Ah. We do. Tianyulong. So I said we'd come back to it. So Tianyulong was described, I want to say, about 2010, 11, 12. It was while I was in China. Xu Xing, my postdoc supervisor out there, worked on it. And I'd seen this thing years before anyone knew about it. It's like just jaw on the floor. It's like, holy hell, you've got a properly, properly filamented ornithician. Um, I joked to him that he should just have sent a photo of it to nature. And I was like, that was the entire submission of the paper. <laughs> is ornithician dinosaur with filaments <laughs> figure one here it is scale bar nice. <laughs> like, submit. Sub- they'll publish it that's all you need to do um but yeah um there's now ah see tianyu long's a confusing one it was doing the rounds on twitter a couple of weeks ago actually this is rather timely entirely by accident so that original specimen that got described and it's been on display a couple of times it's pretty fragmentary so you've You've got a nice head and the front half of the body and then a couple of big gaps missing where the block broke and then about first third of the tail and then the rest is missing. I mean, it's a pretty good specimen, but like clearly there was more of it there and whoever dug it up, it it must have come from some dealer. You know, stuff got broken, stuff got lost, people didn't realise. Or they found it in a rock pile and then of course couldn't find the bit that it had broken from, something like that. Um, More than enough that it's completely unambiguously a heterodontosaur, not least because it's got a really good head. And it's got this basically plume of filaments Roughly in the same place as what we talked about for Cetacosaurus. Quite convenient or right, on the coincidentally, bum. basically on the bum base of the tail, about halfway down the tail. Big, long, thin plumes pushing upward, slightly flexible. You can see there's a slight curve to them. So, you know, as we talked about, stiff spaghetti sprans or horse mane or something like that kind of tech. Yeah. Um, again, people haven't sectioned those and put them under a microscope. wise beyond me? But there we go. Um, that one was knocking around for years and years and years. Another one turned up that got described oh, four or five years ago now, which is a better specimen, but with no soft tissue. So we've got the whole skeleton, but then that one doesn't have any stuff on it. And um, there were photos doing the round on Twitter of two or three weeks ago, at least from when we were recording this, um, of a specimen of Tianyulong with a bunch, like the whole bunch of filaments on it. And a couple of people asked me about it um, and said, oh, what do you know about this one? And has it been described? Yada, yada, yada. It's like, well, I've, I've never seen it before. What I have seen before is I got into a museum collection in eastern China and I was allowed to see a whole bunch of their like off display stuff that was in the collection and no one's ever described or any of this stuff. And they had three, if not four, Tianyu long specimens, one of which was A, basically complete, and B, had big plumes from basically head to tail. Wow. It's like it had a giant mohawk. Nice down its entire body, just the top half, but just like, just this wall. <laughs> 
<laughs> filament and you're just like oh that's really quite different to the tianulong that everyone thinks of as having this little set of tail plumes um that's frustrating why that's different to the other one male and female juvenile and adult different seasonality different species some kind of preservation bias where the front half of the filaments tend to fall out we don't know could have just been a hairy Undescribed one specimen i'm i'm being i'm doing that awkward thing that always used to drive me nuts as a younger researcher where you'd come up with some brilliant idea and suggest it to one of your senior colleagues and go, oh yeah, that, that, that would really explain that problem. Thing is, there's this other specimen I've seen in a museum which proves you wrong, but no one's described it, so I can't tell you that. But there's little point in you it's publishing already if we know it's wrong. Literature. We did a whole episode about scientific literature and yeah. why it's important, and it's very, yeah, very know. poorly but, downloaded that episode. <laughs> and, I, and I wouldn't normally talk about this were it not for the fact that this other specimen is already out there, because mm. it's been on public display, so people have taken photos and are posting it on Twitter, and it's not as furry as the one that I'm talking about, but it's way more than the original. So I'm not revealing super secret weird information here because, again, the you know, you're, word you're is just saying out there's a there's another um, uh, dinosaur that is being described as being put on display, and you have also seen a third, you know, evidence of this that is yet to be described, if yeah. ever it will be. Yeah. So that so there's there's clearly multiple specimens of this, multiple, you know, just like Cetacosaurus, multiple specimens with filaments. So it's not again it's not a one-off it's not an accident it's not some weird chance association of a plant or a <laughs> fell on top of a dead mammal or something like that. um you know it's clearly genuine so we've now got filaments in two distinct and pretty well separate bits of the ornithischian tree up with cetacosaurus down inverted commas with tianulong now tianulong's late jurassic but still it's a heterodontosaur it's an early branch so that would take it lower there's also Kalindodromius from russia um which has some kind of weird filaments on it what's the clindodromia so it would look pretty similar it's it's from another group of animals which would be part of this generic small ornithischian that came after the the stegosaurs and ankylosaurs and before everything else there's a kind of another cluster that that's what the heterodontosaurs used to be part of that kind of big cluster of small bodied kind of um you know, almost like stereotyped small ornithischian. Um, but Kalindodromia sits in there as well. So you've, we have now got these filaments on three different parts of the ornithischian tree. So either it evolves really quite easily, which it might do, or it's evolved early on and potentially been retained by lots of different groups. Now, I'm thinking about these filaments as being a bit like a stiff brush that you get if you're brushing, like, you know, like a dustpan and brush type brush. Is that... Are they thicker than that? Are they thinner than that? Or are they more like the quills in like a feather, like the centre of a feather? Yeah, I, it's um, they look pretty thick on the slabs that I've seen. I mean, so like, almost like porcupine quills, no, not, but not, not stiff. No, yeah. So yeah, I mean that that those kinds of dimensions. So like the the original Tianyulong specimen. Okay, remember like half the tail is missing. I want to say it's you know 35, 40 centimeters long from snout to like halfway down the tiddly time. tail, and those bigger filaments would be about my hand span so that 12 50 or finger and thumb so 12 15 centimeters something like that so a bit longer than a dustpan a bit longer yeah. yeah but probably about a millimeter across okay from mem from memory but yeah, yeah, yeah. i have not have not got the papers out i've not got my photos out i've not got a magnifying glass out. so yeah much more robust than just a hair yeah but equally not some giant flat block of keratin like we talked about tails of scansoria up to rigids there's some other big fat kind of plate spike like filaments on a bunch of other theropods as well I think called baby alsaurus has that um and are these likely but, to just be i mean are they just fulfilling the same role as feathers and fur they're there to keep you warm they make, make you harder to swallow they could be... well that's what you might think were they not just sat over the bum if the whole animal was fluffy you'd go well that's got insulation written all over it mm. but when it's just on this one patch but then again i've seen this and then there are these other specimens that do appear to be greater coverage in which case is there there's something about it you know maybe those you know here's some raw speculation but just an idea of the kind of thing it could be those ones at the base of the tail are a particularly long or strong filament that are being used for signaling and therefore they're stuck in the body much more 
firmly, and it was completely covered in fluff. But when it sits in water decaying for a few weeks, the other fluff falls out and the stronger stuff doesn't. And then lo and behold, you get this weird pattern in the same way that if you find a bird carcass on the beach, you'll often find the primary feathers and a bunch of the wing feathers are still attached when everything else has gone. Because they're really <laughs> basically glued onto the bones. And they don't fall apart very easily. So you can get these, again, taphonomic processes can alter the pattern and what you're looking at is not necessarily the original animal even if you have got soft tissue preservation i just learned a new word taphonomic 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 and that's decaying so we've de- i'm sure we've talked about taphonomy before T- taphonomy yeah. is effectively the from the moment the animal dies to the moment you dig it out of the rock is is how i've had it described to me which i think is a pretty good description of it so it's the it's the study of that process so all fossils are going to have some kind of taphonomic process has happened yeah, to them. otherwise we they, know about them. Well, right, but, but, you know, there's going to be all these different filters and processes and aspects of things. And we've discussed various ones like this, you know, one that dies in a desert is likely to dry out. One that dies in a rainforest is going to have tons of bacteria and fungus and insects and stuff eating it. Things get washed downstream. Things get buried in a flood. Things get buried in volcanic ash. Then the, all the geological processes of crushing it and mineralization and distortion and all of those things and anything that can happen to that animal from the moment it died to the moment we dig it up and get it free of the rock is really covered by taphonomy. Though, of course, the distortion stuff, there's only so much you can do about that. And I think most people's interest is in that burial, decay, alteration process that, you know, the vast majority of which happens early on when you're talking about dinosaurs and 100 million year process. This is, you know, the first 500,000 and maybe even the first five are the most important bit of that. Um, and yeah, the, so taphonomy covers an enormous smorgasbord of different things that can happen to these animals. Don't put anything that's gone through the toponymic process on a smorgasbord because that would take your teeth out. Yes. The- <laughs> Yeah, potentially. There's lots and lots and lots of processes that are affecting these organisms. And this is why taphonomy is so, so important, because we want to understand that and we don't want to come to false conclusions. That's why when I'm doing stuff like um, bite marks and feeding traces and all of this stuff for my theropods, I want to understand what happened to that animal before they did that. Because if there is really good evidence that that carcass was bouncing around in a river for, you know, we won't be able to know if it's hours or days or weeks. And got churned up yeah. all the rocks and it looks like it's been bitten lots and it hasn't, it's just rocks. Well, but more if that happened before those bites, that can only realistically have been scavenging. Yeah, because... If that happened afterwards, well, we don't know. It could have been predation, it could have been scavenging. Unless you really hated is... that dinosaur and you saw it yeah. in distress being fit and you thought, <laughs> I'm going to bite you as well. Anyway, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, right, but that that's why, you know, taphonomy is super, super important for this. And again, the social stuff that we've talked about here's a group of animals that died together great was there a drought going on because if there was that would have driven them to the water source was there a flood that did this and how high power was that flood because it will move different things you know a flood can be really quite a gentle event at the margins of things and if you've got a dirty great dead sauropod which even though it's really quite pneumatic and might float very well flood waters that are very very gentle will struggle to shift it and so if there's a dozen of them dead together even if there was evidence of a flood it probably didn't wash them all together they were probably already dead there together and so yeah this is all of the taphonomic process and taphonomic studies which then are so so important for filtering back even to things like behavior and ecology like this um anything else i should know about heterodontosaurs before we bring our guest on i think we've covered the most important things i think we have they're an interesting little group we've got some really good skeletons of them they're probably the earliest ornithisians they're probably Probably uh, omnivores, which would make them pretty much unique among the Ornithischia. Um, they've got some fun stuff going on with their teeth. They've got some fun stuff going on with their body coverings. And if we're going to sort out when the first Ornithischians actually appeared and who they're related to, these are the animals which are going to solve it. And there was a new Heterodontosaurus found in South Africa recently. Um, and that was in the news because they've just scanned it. And it looks like a like superb specimen, like absolutely brilliant. Uh, and so obviously potentially some really nice new um, data on its anatomy and therefore its evolutionary relationships is probably coming out of that one. So this could be a very timely podcast if something is published in the next three to five years. (laughs) Timely. (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah, well, that's what happened. I, I submitted a paper this week with colleagues, which we started 12 years ago by my count. Well, you know, in terms of though time and evolutionary time, that's very, very speedy. So, well Oh, it, I mean, it's, it's, it's instant. I mean, it uses light speed. <laughs> I always find this is a danger when we introduce guests, because it does feel a bit like if you've seen something like Comedians in Cars Getting Coffee, where Jerry Seinfeld actually goes out and tries to find a, a car that's most like the comedian. And I think Beck Hill is far more exciting than a heterodontosaur. <laughs> I mean, she does she does amazing things. Like she has a new TV show uh, that started in September called Make Away Take Away. She also famously, if you're into your nerd stuff, has a podcast called A Problem Squared, uh, which she does with the amazing Matt Parker. So uh, she knows everything and everything. She knows maths and how to get messy. I mean, what can you say? And anyway, here she is with a question for Dave. So welcome to Terrible Lizards, Beck. So lovely to have you here. I hope you enjoy your very spacious cupboard under the stairs. Like Harry Potter. Um, <laughs> tell me, um, have you, are you interested in dinosaurs at all? Is this an interest of yours or has it been a forgotten childhood thing? Oh my goodness, right. I nearly wore this. I was meant to wear this t-shirt today to show you and that I'm terribly unorganized. But when I was seven, the two things I was most obsessed with were dinosaurs and troll dolls. And <gasps> I, I painted Look at my hair t-shirt. and tell me. I was going to say, you still are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you get it. You get it. In fact, I actually did a deep when the newest troll films came out. I I it, I did a whole deep dive on my YouTube channel because I was like, which one's the real troll? Because the new ones don't look like the ones that I know. And oh. that's, it, there's a lot of legal stuff. Oh, oh, excellent! There's a ton of legal battles that went on about the true owners of trolls. It's really fascinating, um, and it, like a lot of the rights got passed over between companies. Anyway, anyway, we're totally off subject. So trolls and dinosaurs. Dinosaurs. And I painted a T-shirt when I was seven that said uh, "Troll meets Jurassic Park," and it's just a troll with a T-Rex. I think I saw the film for my birthday. I mean, anyone listening can now absolutely work out my age. But um, ah, oh, I, I was so—it was so exciting, and um, I, I can still fit into it because it was massive when I was seven. But well, that's um, what I was going to say as soon as you said I was going to wear this T-shirt, and then it came to when I was seven, and I'm like. <laughs> Yeah. No, now uh, it looks like a fitted this? t-shirt. Beck is the velociraptor to our Allosaur. This is... <laughs> <laughs> I hate that I know enough about dinosaurs to get that joke. Um, <laughs> um, for the listeners, uh, Izzy's held up her hand at like chest height when she was suggesting how tall I am. I Everyone thinks I'm shorter than I am. Like if if I was sitting down and I was like, hold out your hand to how tall you think I am and I stand up. It's I'm not kidding. It's usually about uh like my head height difference to like, it's like a foot too low people always think i'm heap short i think it's because i dress like a child that people are like ah she's a child also i like to stand really far away from people i mean that's yeah. just safe in these in these times so you're a massive fan of dinosaurs and of trolls do you have a dinosaur and or troll question today <laughs> hopefully hopefully more the former than the latter <laughs> Um, uh, I wanted to know, um, because I, have you had Jay Foreman on this podcast yet? We haven't yet. No, oh, and, no, okay. I want to get him on with oh. his dinosaur song. Yeah. Well, I mean, cause I did that a you, chat that. you two did together, didn't you? Yeah. 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 So I'm going to steal this question. I'm sure I can put, hook you guys up. Um, he might have his own, but in his, so Jay Foreman does a song called Dinosaurs, which I did a flip chart for. And in the song and in the flip chart, there is a Diplodocus riding around London. Um, uh, on four double-decker buses, like using them as oh, roller right. skates. Yeah, and I want to know: is that accurate? Like that? Because four <laughs> double de- four double-decker buses is like a lot. Yeah. Um, so, in terms of the suspension <laughs> handling the weight. Yeah, you're probably going to want something like that. In terms of the oh. spacing, you'd have to probably put all four of them pretty close to each other to get one foot on each. Yeah. Um, and then we get into the issues of Diplodocus taxonomy. So anyone who's been to a museum, particularly in the UK, you'll have seen Dippy the Dippy. Diplodocus at the Natural History Museum that's now gone and is going on tour. Yeah. Dippy <laughs> is a copy of the original Diplodocus Carnegie specimen in the Carnegie Museum, hence the name in Pittsburgh. So the original is in Pittsburgh. They made a copy which came to the NHM and oh, then... Oh wait, a... Dippy's not even the original? Dippy's nope. a cover nope. act. 
Yeah. Um, I know somebody when they took it down who got a bit of the plaster, on it, a bit of bit of vertebra. Yeah. Um, also, Dave, before you carry on, I'm desperate to say the word that I always don't know how to say because I always say frangipan. And I don't mean frangipan. I mean flagelli you cordata. Mean, there you go. Yes. Diplodocus is a flagelli cordata. It is a whip tail, uh, which is a group of dinosaurs that have these super long and super thin tails. I just love that word. <laughs> uh, Dippy in Carnegie cast in the UK but also a bunch of other places so it's like Milan Moscow Berlin Paris Munich and I can't remember what the other one is now but they've all got the same cast and now there's been casts of it in other places so people who've been to museums all around the world have seen Diplodocus Carnegie specimen and that's yeah. everyone's like mental picture of Diplodocus it's not the only species there's Diplodocus longicordus I mean that's a great name so literally long tail so it's one with an even longer tail than the one that everyone's used but don't to you see. think of it as in the kitchen whilst on the phone in the living room because it's cord is that long <laughs> on its main line oh that's good that's what that's what that one immediately made me think of stretching the phone to get away from your mum and if you put that dinosaur on its back, it has a little hold music button on it's it. It's got the little thing, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Definitely. So there's that one. And then there's things, for what of a better word, so there's the famous like Seismosaurus, which was described as a new one, and I think even Ultrasaurus was as well, which were often informal names, which Seismosaurus in particular is now considered another species of Diplodocus, but a much bigger one, or at least the one specimen we have of it, is much bigger than Carnegie. Oh. So but where I'm going is that like everyone's mental picture of Diplodocus is like one species. Um, yeah, and this is the one that we often have with dinosaurs. Well, we are indeed one individual of one species. I always got Brontosaurus and Diplodocus mixed up, and I don't know if there is are they, are they is it like Holland and Netherland? Like are they they're like the same or N- no? So they 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 are different things. Brontosaurus, which is a name that went and then came back again, is an apatosaurine, and it's very close to being called Apatosaurus. Which, if you go oh. to the Carnegie Museum in Pittsburgh, literally stands next to Diplodocus. So you've got Diplodocus and Apatosaurus next to each other. They have really broad, fat necks. Um, they're rather more barrel-chested. They're, they're a fairly different shape and, and fairly different animals. Oh, then which one's the Brachiosaurus then? Or is that like a Brontosaurus, but with a little thing on its head? Bra- Brachiosaurus, yeah, it has the weird crest on its head and it's very, very upright. And that's the one you gotcha. get in Jurassic Park and it's feeding high in the trees because the neck mm-hmm. is held up and not out. That I'm bit. glad you did that. Yeah, when yeah. they're coming in, yeah. you see them loafing along. Yeah, because yeah. I, I was, you know, I was having trouble picturing it based on that description. I, I, you know, I thought it was the uh, tricep. No, I'm, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> but but so trying to get back to the question this is what you always about do. the buses it's important the buses dave right very important so if if you went for seismosaurus that's a really quite a lot bigger than diplodocus carnegii and that's a bit more in your favor in terms of sticking a foot each on a four different double deck of buses ah. <laughs> it's a but lot bigger animal i would suggest though that unless it's got massive feet to sort of like cover the padding it's going to go through the ceilings because i don't think double deck buses oh. are particularly strong ceiling yeah i mean so it's I... going to be more like like boots they're going to be more off like t- you know thigh high boots on them yeah off the top of my head i obviously don't know the weights of these animals uh from what why? i recall i mean i would why i would you, guess you were even on this it... show <laughs> Well, well, because it's mine, so I can do what I want. <laughs> we will just we will have just been discussing the very difficult ways of measuring the weights of different dinosaurs. Of dinosaurs. So Are you telling me true. that it's hard to weigh something that not only doesn't exist right now but hasn't existed for millions of years? Uh, yes, and not only that, I can't remember these estimates for every individual of fifteen hundred <laughs> species. Boo. <laughs> Bad paleontologist. <laughs> to be fair, like I don't know how much a can of beans weighs. Uh, that's going to be about 350 grams, isn't it? How 100? come you know more about beans than you do dinosaurs, Dave? Because <laughs> <laughs> it's written on all of them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, if only that were the case. If they came with their weight written. Yes. <laughs> yeah, if the bones came, it would probably have a best before date on it. <laughs> best before Cenozoic. <laughs> <laughs> 
But I'd be I'd be surprised, you know, because there's a capacity to buses, and I'd be surprised how many humans would make up a quarter of the weight of one seismosaurus. That's where I'm going. I, I reckon yeah. it would be 40-odd tons. So you're looking at 10 tons each foot. Wow. And, yeah, that's a lot of people, and I don't think they have the suspension for that, particularly as it'll all be at the back or the front. It's not going to be smack in the middle of the bus. Yeah, I, I, well, they're certainly going to go straight through the roof and the top deck. <laughs> <laughs> it is like booties. Boots. It's very cute. Yeah. Just yeah. yeah, like little socks. But also the rear ones, you've got the rear legs through the driver on one side as well. Yeah. So I don't think your um cartoon is looking good. They sit they sit to the side. Maybe I need to do a new version of the flip chart that is all scientifically correct. Where it's just <laughs> the, the horror of it. Because they're really cute dinosaurs in it. But if we had like just a really gory uh, glass and blood sort of pouring yeah. out of yeah the seismosaurus is that i get saying that right in my seismosaurus yeah yeah well so uh earth shaker so as in seismic oh i see oh. S-E- oh. s-e-i-s yeah not size s-i-z-e yeah, S-E-I-S. yeah. So they call yeah they call me the seismosaurus oh <laughs> <No>, okay <laughs> izzy's dancing does not show up on audio fortunately <laughs> <laughs> Fortunately, so that, does that does that answer your question? But do you have a, another question you would like to ask regarding buses, trolls, or dinosaurs? Uh, yes. Uh, which dinosaur was ended up being a budgie? Because I really like budgies. Budgie budgies are great. Um, yeah. So I think a lot of people have started to grasp the idea that birds are dinosaurs. But the result of that is exactly the mistake you've made. You're thinking like each individual dinosaur or various different dinosaur species went on to produce various different birds. Whereas what you've actually got is one group of dinosaurs went on to form birds, and then mm. they have radiated and evolved into all of these incredible different species that we have. Um, gotcha. So there's 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 it's always one answer I, I see this online all the time they're like which dinosaur became chickens or which dinosaur or which one came from t-rex and yeah. yeah it's not like it's not like that it's what we had is yeah this this whole burst of of radiation that went on to produce ten and a half thousand species give or take of modern birds is it like someone saying to me like oh which which grandparents ended up you know being the grandparents of you and which ones are the grandparents of your brother I'm like, yeah yeah, pr- pretty much. Yeah, I was, I was I was thinking of a kind of royal equivalent of like you know, well, which of Henry the Eighth? You know, yeah. Each it's not like yeah, it, it's this descendants and descendants and descendants. It's mm. yeah. We did this on um on making history once, and it's really weird. It's like the everybody in Europe's the common ancestor of everybody is like 600 years ago. Everybody has a person that they're all directly related to that was alive back in the 1400s. Everybody in Europe. It's really close. And then for the world, it's only like two or 3,000 years ago. And that includes forgotten tribes or something. Yeah, it's it's a bit more than that. But yeah, the, this is what you get. It's, it's the... really not more than that. That's why it's shocking. You're looking at me like you don't believe me at all. But I'm telling you, they did statistics on it and it blew my mind away but the for the world one it's not even you know it's only a few thousand years it's not even like what you'd expect because i would have thought all of these different you know peoples living you know independently hunter gatherers in forest and stuff wouldn't have had any interaction but the thing is they have and everybody's genetically linked much closer than you imagine my brain is just i was like i i haven't done any research i wasn't born in europe I have nothing to bring to this. Well, yeah, but your ancestors (laughs) were, so... (laughs) I was like, I will take a step back and let this this pan out. (laughs) So it's more that a budgie came from some other different birds, and at one point that bird came from a dinosaur sort of. Basically, yeah, but it's it's kind of like if you if you looked at something like I was thinking, yeah, family trees, but royalty simply because people, you know, you you've got that like continual succession, and if you follow that chain back mm. of you know each king or queen to their parents and their parents and their parents and their parents, and going all the way back, you know, a few thousand years or a thousand years for the British, you know, 
William the Conqueror. And then it would almost be like going, okay, well, here's all of his relatives. Which one is the ancestor of Prince Charles? And which one is the ancestor of William? And which one is the ancestor of Edward? Yeah, it, it's right. not like that. There, there's a chain that's come down and then eventually that chain or, you know, all different parts of that chain and those branches have died off. And what we're looking at is one remnant mm. of one lineage. Now, in the case of birds, we're looking at a hell of a lot of them because there's like 10,000 species of birds. But they've ultimately come from that one point that we could trace back to the origin of dinosaurs. And it's not like each dinosaur has produced a separate one. Hmm. I did not think of that. I like that. But that one dinosaur didn't just go on to do the birds. It did do the Scansioraptor rigids. It did do the Velociraptors. It did do other species in as well as birds. Yeah, we've, we've, we've got this, we've, we've got this complicated split where the birds and a bunch of feathered dinosaurs are all so closely related to each other we can barely tell them apart. But yeah, that one species, or better thought of as kind of an evolving lineage, we are drawing a line on that and going, right, everything after this is a bird. And that includes all the extinct birds, many of which lived alongside the dinosaurs, as well as all those living ones as well. It, it did pretty well. <laughs> But the point is, your budgie, or even if it's yeah. fictional for the time being, is a proper dinosaur equal to something like Triceratops or even Stegosaurus or even T-Rex. It is equally as dinosaur as those creatures are. So you can yes. be proud in knowing that at least yes. one dinosaur loves cuttlefish for no obvious reason. <laughs> <laughs> I, but that's for the bird podcast that's true but all bird podcasts are dinosaur podcasts they just won't admit it yeah they just don't know it yeah Sting. that's tr that's true actually oh, that's yeah they're nice. subordinate to us a casual birder <laughs> lady on uh Susie and um yeah and uh, she's been she she only started listening to our podcast when we invited her to be on it and she's like oh, and she's like <gasps> and now she's like <laughs> looking at her finches in a whole new way Oh, amazing! But which, uh, which, uh, you know, dinosaur podcast did uh, did the bird podcast come from? <laughs> Well, you know, just like here, we, you know, we had the bird podcast first, and it was only when people started digging into it that they discovered that there were other podcasts which yeah. <laughs> held the secrets to the origin of the bird podcast. I'm sure if you ask Matt Parker about, like, there, there'd be a way of, like, you know, putting lines in between the different evolutionary. It'd be a web shaped thing. There'd be there'd be a sort of the, the equation that you could get for the number of podcasts about birds versus dinosaurs and popularity, and there's some sort of statistical model which would just show you that birds are dinosaurs you could probably prove it just oh, yeah. with podcast audience oh he'd create a spreadsheet it for it it would be good yeah. he'd, he'd run a homoscedastistic curve through it or something good variation around the mean you see you got the wrong person on this show to understand yeah. what that means yeah. you want matt and to me. be talking about that stuff <laughs> i like silly uh, yeah. words hence why i like phylogeny chordata hence why i like um homoscedastistic and hence why i like um uh, scansuri up to rigids good words you Ooh, see what's that one Scans oh they're they're mad they're they're little bat likes they got bat like wings okay they don't have a tail they have these weird sort of like plastic rulers sticking out their bums instead of proper tail and as well as having bat like wings they got feathers because why not and little squashed faces with like little pincer teeth and they're only little, but they're called Scansioraptor rigids, and they're a type of dinosaur. Dave told me about them. He should have probably oh, said I've all that. Got to look that up. Don't worry, we've got a whole episode on them. Yay! <laughs> I, they should create a comic. They should create. Did they, in the episode you talk about how that dinosaur should? What was it called again? Can you say it for me? Scansioraptor rigids. Oh. Well, the 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 the, the... scan. <laughs> Scan, sorry, opter, rigids. Scan, sorry, opter. Scan, sorry, opter, rigids. Man, I would read that comic. Yeah. That was what I, that's where I was getting at on the bat thing. That's a good. It's just Batman with feathers. Well, yeah, we, need to, we need to draw it, so it's you need to... Smaller than you expect. A friend of mine, who's it? I think Gareth Monger did this, and he, he did he did a Batman logo with the Scansory on to Rigid. So <gasps> he's already got a head start. But to be fair, one of the Scansory up to Rigid, I think it's called Wee Chi, is that right? Yeah, yeah, it's E that he did it for. Aww. E, so what? Oh, it's a Pokemon. E, it's literally called E. It's a Scansory up to Rigid called E, called YI Man. E. YI Man? It's like from Newcastle. Uh, if you have socials, you put that up on your socials. Mm -hmm. I'm saying, look at those. Dave, stop looking at Google. Concentrate. We've got to say goodbye to Beck. 
<laughs> all of your amazing so you do maths podcasts you do um anime podcast you do children's tv arty shows you do a book called slime where can everybody find you slime, what is your yep. website um if you just google beck hill just and if you can't remember that just take out the space and it's beach hill but um <laughs> yeah it, it'll my socials and everything will come up um the tv show is called makeaway takeaway um the slimes part of the series called horror heights yeah people just look that up they can find me i'm you know obviously i've done a dinosaur show now so i think that's the trifecta of nerdship what like i've got the maths Anime, dinosaurs. Oops. I don't think there's anything Star left. Wars and chess. Oh, yeah. No, chess, I think that'll be the next you also, one. You also yeah. definitely Absolutely. need, um, you know, samurai swords, a katana at some point. You're going to need how to slice through oh, stuff. Oh, yeah. I can help you out there. Just, you know, give me the nod. <laughs> yeah. I know people with mats to slice it. I've done that. Well, I mean, I really enjoy uh, Beat Saber, so I'm halfway Boom. there. Well, thank you very much. And um, it's been lovely to have you on the show. And oh, this has been absolutely absolute joy thank you massive thank you to beck hill do uh check out make away take away especially if you've got little short people or are a little short person yourself also do check out her podcast she problem squared is what you probably would like if you like ours and yeah she's much more exciting unless of course i'm assuming that um hetchodontosaurus was a very plain looking animal but it could have been i mean do we have any colored data for us at all not that's one of the ones that you really wish that people would look at and and hasn't been done i've definitely seen some very colourful artwork and interpretations it of might it. be just like Beck it might be really brightly coloured and exciting and make squeaky Proper noises rainbow yeah could be so let's hope for that um, like I say we do accept your artwork submissions which we will retweet and put on our Patreon uh, as 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 the mood takes us but um, if you want to show us that that'd be awesome and until next week should we say rar? oh go on then rawr. Rawr. this episode of Terrible Lizards was made possible by our generous patrons on Patreon. To support the show and for bonus content, please go to patreon.com forward slash terrible lizards. For links to everything, including merch and past episodes, go to terriblelizards.co.uk. Please follow us both on Twitter. I'm at I-S-Z-I underscore L-A-W-R-E-N-C-E and Dave is at D-A-V-E underscore H-O-N-E. Send us your questions either via Patreon or terriblelizardspod at gmail.com. If you can't afford to support us on patreon please do write a review and recommend the show to your friends thank you so much for your support it means a lot to us 